Shalom. First and foremost, I want to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Racha Akwadash. <clears throat> Double honors to the elders and the apostles of Great Millstone, and peace and blessings to the elect. And today we're going to be going into Ezekiel, the third chapter, um, which in Ezekiel, the second chapter, really from the first chapter up till now, is pretty much the Lord uh, appearing to Ezekiel and 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 um you know instructing him in what what he wants what the lord wants ezekiel to do so third chapter is a continuation of the second chapter where the lord is basically speaking to ezekiel letting him know this is this is why i'm here and this is what i want you to go and do all right so this is ezekiel chapter three now this is still a part of the that vision that he's seen okay of you know the angels the lord the chariots all of that uh, Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 1 Moreover he said unto me Son of man Eat that thou findest Eat this roll And go speak unto the house of Israel Now remember at the end of the second chapter There was a roll of a book That was that was spread out before Ezekiel And he said that it was written on this side And on the back side Woes and lamentation and so on and so forth So now the Lord is telling him to eat this roll and then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, now a roll, back then, today we have it, when we have a book, we have, like, it looks like a square or, you know, a small, smallish rectangle, and, you know, it has the hard cover, sometimes a soft cover, and so on. Back then, you had rolls, which were like scrolls that were rolled up. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Now what this what this represents was Ezekiel understanding the message that the Lord had for him, that he was supposed to go and, and, and relay to the children of Israel. Because when you look up the word... Um, belly right because it says cause thy belly to eat one of the definitions here for belly which let me actually look up something here uh, we have okay one of the definitions here for belly is you have a uh, baton and one of the definitions here says as seat of mental faculties. So today it's kind of like somebody says food for thought, which is not your your mind doesn't actually eat food, okay? But it's 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 likened the analogy is likened onto how you actually eat food physically when you consume something with your mind. So in, in the vision, Ezekiel might have actually done this, but. What it represents is him actually intaking the, the message of the Lord and, and digesting it and fully understanding it and then going to, to teach or um, relay that message to the children of Israel. At least in this case, the captives that, that were with him there at Babylon. Verse, uh, verse 4, And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto them of the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. See, and that's that's something the Lord always He kept He keeps mentioning to Ezekiel, go and speak with my words. I'm coming to you with a message specifically for you to go and tell them. Go and tell them that. And tell them I said it. Verse 5: For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard of an hard language, but to the house of Israel. Meaning that the people I'm sending you to, these are not foreigners. They don't speak a different language that you can't understand or it's hard to interpret. They speak the same language as you. I'm, I'm sending you to, to your own people. Not to many people of a strange speech and of an hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely, had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. And that's the Lord is, is saying that, uh, to, to say that, to emphasize the rebelliousness of Israel, saying that I'm not even sending you to, to foreigners, I'm sending you to your own people. 
But guess what? Even if I if I had sent you to people who spoke a different language that that you didn't understand, they would have listened to you. But my people are so disobedient that they don't they're not they're not listening to me. And in fact, guess what? They're not even gonna listen to you. But I have to send you there anyway so that they will know that there's a prophet among them. That way, when I bring whatever I'm going to bring upon them, they have no excuse. Because somebody was there, and the Lord is going to explain that as we keep on reading. Somebody was there to give you the warning. Whether you listen or not, it's fair because I gave you a warning. You just did not take heed. So you can't come back to the Lord and say, oh, Lord, you got, you're you so unrighteous. And how could you bring such crazy and harsh and painful judgments upon us? And the Lord can say, here's the proof. This was the warning that I gave you. That's the prophet. He came there. He said this, then and that you did not listen. So that's on you. Verse seven. And that's why the Lord charged the prophets to say, it's your job to warn them. Because if you don't warn them, I'm still going to destroy them for doing wickedness, but I'm going to, their, their blood is on you. Verse 7. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they are for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. So I'm sending you to them, but just know that for the most part, they're not really going to listen to you. Because that's that's them. They don't even listen to me. And I'm I'm <laughs> I'm the Heavenly Father, I'm the creator. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. And when we looked up the word impudent, meaning that they, 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 they don't show the due respect that they should, at least in this case to the Heavenly Father. And they're hard-hearted. They're stuck in their ways. You can't tell them anything. You can't tell them all. You can't tell them shit. They do what they want. They can do bad all by themselves. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces and thy forehead strong against their foreheads meaning the lord is the lord is basically telling them, I, I've, I've given you that spirit to be bold like like today they'll say you go toe to toe or face to face with someone meaning that neither side is backing down they're both they're both going at it so that's what the lord is saying i've, I've made your face strong against their faces and your forehead strong against their foreheads as an adamant harder than flint, have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Now, when you actually look up adamant, they say that adamant is one of the strongest stones out there. And <clears throat> um, when you actually look into the word in the Hebrew, matter, let me just pull up the definition, the definition that I saw. But when you look at the word in the Hebrew, you'll see something like this where are we at verse 9 for adamant what's that shamayar or shamyar and here it says uh, thorns 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 bushes adamant as sharp a sharp stone flint perhaps a diamond and when you look here from the hebrew it says in the original sense of pricking now, when you actually look this up, they, they basically brought saying that because they, they're saying, for example, there are certain stones like the adamant stone that is strong enough that it can be used to to etch certain things into certain hard metals, like like certain you know metals and gold and all these things. So you need a really, really strong material if you're going to be able to, to make etchings or signs inside of another strong material. So i.e. adamant meaning something that is very, very uh, strong, almost impenetrable. Adamant. Yeah, let's look up stone. Right, so it says an adamant is an imaginary stone of impenetrable hardness. Historically, the word applied to actual stones and other substances believed to be impenetrable. In the 17th century, the word was used as a synonym of diamond. The noun adamant comes from the Latin word meaning material of extreme hardness. Now, when you look here, it says, what does the word adamant mean in the Bible? And you also have here, yeah, what is the adamant stone in the Bible? 
The Hebrew word for adamant basically means pricking and is often translated briars. When used in connection with a stone, however, it means a pricking stone, one which can engrave metals or glass. So that's pretty much what they have there. But in context of Ezekiel chapter 3, the Lord is basically saying that I've made you tough, right? As, as, an, as, adamant, as an adamant harder than a flint have I made thy forehead. So you don't, you don't, don't back down. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart and hear with thine ears. So all the instructions that I'm giving you, listen very carefully, okay, and store them in your mind. And go and get thee to them of the captivity, unto the children of thy people, and speak unto them and tell them, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. And, it, and them of the captivity, meaning those Israelites that were captive there along with Ezekiel over there in, in, uh, in Babylon. And, and these were mainly uh, the Israelites of the, of the southern kingdom. But you still had some Israelites of the northern kingdom that were that were sprinkled in there because during the time of the split between the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, after the, the ascension of uh, Rehoboam to the throne, you still had certain Israelites that 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 came down to Judah and decided that they weren't going to follow the heathenistic ways, the idolatrous ways that the northern kingdom were, were partaking in. So it wasn't all all the northern kingdom that were wicked. You had some of them that that refused to go along with the madness that was over there. And one example of that of those individuals is Tobit. When you read the first chapter of Tobit, he tells you what nature he was in before he got before they got uh, deported over there to the land of Assyria. So the Lord says, "Go and tell them." what I have to say, whether they listen or whether they, they don't care, still go and tell them. Verse 12, then the spirit took me up and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing saying, blessed be the glory of the Lord Yahweh from his place. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures. See, so remember, this is still the same, the same vision from the first chapter, the living creatures, the angels that he saw with the four faces and the chariots. So he says, yeah, I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another and the noise of the wheels over against them, which were the chariots and the noise of a great rushing. So you can imagine what that sounds like. So you can hear the wings flapping and you can hear the sound of the chariot or the chariots. And he says, and the noise of a great rushing. So the spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness, in the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord Yahweh was strong upon me. And when, why is that? Because the the things that he just saw, plus the, the 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 words that the Lord is telling him, it was a lot. It was it was almost overwhelming for Ezekiel. And you're gonna find out as we keep on reading. Because imagine here it is, you're a captive, and. All of a sudden, you the Lord comes to you and you see this vision of all these things. You, you, you know I mean, you're trying to comprehend what's going on here. And the Lord is telling you, look, I need you to go and do this and that and this. And you pretty much don't have a choice in the matter because <laughs> it's the Lord telling you this. Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Abib that dwelt by the river of, of Kebar. I sat. Oh, and also when you when you look in verse 14, and it says, so the spirit lifted me up and took me away. When you look into the word uh, took there, it's actually, um, it's it's a verb, right? Which is, which is, let me see, I think it's lakwach. Spirit took me, there you go, lakwach, which is in a natural physical sense to take, to carry, to seize, to take, right? To be captured, to be taken, to be removed, to be taken away, to flash about. 
Okay, so so Ezekiel says here that the spirit, basically the spirit of the Lord lifted him up and took took him away, and then he went in bitterness. You know, so maybe the Lord did take him, uh, uh, move him from one place to another. Okay, or you know maybe it's just that the Lord, the spirit was on him and he just you know he went his way. Okay, but it doesn't really specify too much in here if he got beamed up and he got brought back down somewhere like uh, Philip. Okay, or if, or if he just he saw the vision and after that he just he just walked. <laughs> okay, but nonetheless, the point is that after the Lord came to him, told him these things, he went. Right, verse fifteen. Then I then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Aviv, that dwelt by the river of Kibar, and I sat there. And let me let me hear how this guy actually pronounces this word here. Let's see. Strong's H thirty-five twenty-nine. Kevar. Kevar. Uh, he's gonna pronounce it in the in the so-called Hebrew, Hebra. And I sat, and I sat where they sat, and remained there astonished among them seven days. So for a whole week, Ezekiel was pretty much messed up. But messed up in the sense that it's not like he lost his mind, but he was just he was just in a state of almost like shock of trying to understand. He was overwhelmed because of that vision that he saw. And he was just just trying to trying to wrap his head around everything. Like, yo, you just saw angels. They must have been, I mean, it, for the sound of their wings flapping to, to be like that, like a rushing, like, like a crazy rushing wind, they must have been pretty sizable. And then to see the chariots and to hear them, I mean, you, he saw them up close. That's why he was able to describe them like that. And then to see them, the glory of the Lord, it was a lot. And then to hear the Lord tell him, now I need you to do this, that, and the third. So he needed some time to take that all in. Verse 16, And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came on to me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. So the Lord says, remember I commissioned you, now you're a watchman. So you are gonna watch out for anything that I have to say concerning these people, and you're gonna give them that warning. And the analogy here is a watchman is on a watchtower, watching the, over the city to see if there are any, anything, any dangers, anything they need to, to, to alert the people of. And in this case, the most high is the danger. He is the events. He is the things that are that are going to befall this city. Ezekiel is the watchman, and the people are the Israelites. So he says, "You're going to hear the word at my mouth, and then you're going to warn them." Because at the end of the day, that's why the scriptures tell you that. Let's actually get that real quick. Isaiah 45 and 7. This is the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 6 that they may know from the rising of the sun, which is in the east, and from the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord Yahweh, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. So if there's going to be any danger, oh, matter of fact, let's get another one real quick. It's Amos 5. If there's going to be any danger or any any evil, the Most High does it. And if there's going to be any good or any deliverance, the Most High does it. Meaning that when when the Lord says, warn them from me, any danger, whether it's another nation coming to besiege you, whether it's pestilence or famine or wild animals, that's really the Lord. So when you warn people saying, oh, the, the, the Babylonians are coming or these people are coming, that's really the Lord behind it. He's the danger, but at the same time, he's also the, the the safety. That's why he says, "Warn them from me," because this this is these are the things that I'm capable of. Um, actually, I think this is actually Amos three. Yeah, Amos chapter three, verse six: Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city? And the Lord Yahweh hath not done it. So all evil and all good comes from the Lord, as we just read in Isaiah 45. That's why he's telling Ezekiel, warn them from me. I'm the real danger. Verse 18. 
When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. In this context, the wicked is talking about Israelites here. So the Lord is saying, I've made you a watchman onto the, the house of Israel, onto these Israelites. And when I say unto the wicked, meaning those that are doing wickedly, they're, they're not following the ways of the Lord, that they're going to die because of the things that they're doing. And you don't go and give them warning because I'm telling you, hey, this person, these, these things that they're doing over there is going to result in them being destroyed. That's, that's your cue to go over there and tell them, yo, the Lord said, if you don't stop that madness you're doing over there, you know, looking after other people's wives and, and, and doing all this manner of idolatry and wickedness, that he's going to destroy you. So the Lord says, if you don't, if I say that and you don't go and warn them, nor speak is to warn the wicked from his wicked way, meaning stop what you're doing or else you're going to be destroyed, that, that perhaps is to save his life, meaning that there's a chance that from the warning you give him, he'll listen and he'll stop. And if he stops and repents, then he won't be destroyed. So if you don't go and do that, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity because he's going to keep doing the wickedness that he's doing and then he's going to be destroyed. That's how it works. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Meaning that it's going to be on you. So now, now you're going to have to pay for that as well. Kind of like you are the first driver driving on a bridge and as you're going, you see, you see that halfway through the bridge has collapsed. So you stop and you start going in the other way. And you see more people coming in this direction towards the collapsed area. If you if if they keep going, they're obviously gonna fall off and die. But it's up to you knowing what's over there to warn them and say, hey, don't go that way, turn around that perhaps they may listen to you and then they will turn around and they won't die. But if you don't give them that warning, they're going to keep on going and they're going to fall off and die. But that guilt is going to be on you because you didn't tell them, you didn't warn them. Knowing that what was, was, what was going to befall them, you didn't warn them. Verse 19, yet if thou warn the wicked, so if you do your job and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So if you warn them and say, look, this is what the Lord says. You need to stop what you're doing or else this is what's going to happen to you. And they don't care. They're like, I, bro, honestly, you, you, you are wasting your breath. I'm going to keep doing what I'm going to keep doing. Right? He shall die in his iniquity, meaning they're going to be destroyed for it. But the blood is off of your hands. You did your job. There's nothing more you can do. If this, person, if this person loves going after married women to commit adultery and you're telling them you need to stop because the Most High is going to destroy you. Adultery is a sin unto death. And he says, I really don't give a damn. Married women are my thing. That's what I do. I don't like single women. I specifically like to go after other men's wives. He says something like that. What are you going to do? The most you can do is give him the warning and tell him, okay, then the Most High is going to destroy you. What Are you, are you going to spy on him? Are you going to stop everything you're doing in your life you're going to put on the binoculars and you're just going to watch him. And anytime you see that he got a sneaky link or some appointment coming up, you're going to follow him. Sneak up into the house, slide down from the chimney and stop him. The second he's about to get down, you grab him and throw him somewhere. You say, look, you can't do that. That's off. That's not, that's not your job. Your job or our job as watchmen is to give warning. That's it. Okay. But thou has delivered thy soul. So it's not, it's not your fault. It's not on you now. But if you don't go and give the warning, then, then that's a problem. And the same thing the Lord told Ezekiel is telling Ezekiel here in the third chapter. It, it Guess what? It applies to us now. And it really, it applies to all the, all the prophets. Because especially in, in this time, our people are committing a lot of iniquity. I mean, one after another after another. That's why we're in the conditions that we're in today. So our job out there is to warn you. That's why we have to always constantly be diligent and constantly keep giving out the warnings. Because the reward, the first and foremost, is going to be that we delivered our souls. 
as it says here, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So nobody's blood is going to be on our hands because we've done our job. Verse 20, again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Meaning, when somebody that's, that's good, that's been doing well, turns and starts going down the, the wicked path, the reason they do that is because the Lord laid a stumbling block. A stumbling block is, is, is something that's put in the way to trip you up. So you stumble at it or you fall. What it means is that the Lord might either put a spirit of, of you know, um, iniquity upon him, or a spirit of evil up, upon them, or a spirit of deception upon them, or something like that, to where it causes them to go into the way of error. And then they end up they end up dying in that in that wickedness because it doesn't matter how righteous you were before. The ways of the Lord still stands, meaning that He says this the 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 um the wages of sin is death. So if you stop what you're doing in righteousness and then you turn around and go into wickedness, you're going to suffer that penalty. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. So whether this person is a wicked individual doing wickedness, or a righteous individual that turned wrong, went rogue, and started doing wickedness, you still got to warn them. Because if you don't, they're going to keep doing what they're doing, they're going to be destroyed, but I'm going to punish you for it. It's like um, when, when for, for older siblings, whether you have one younger sibling or you have many, it really is worse when you have a lot more younger siblings and you're a, little, you're a lot more older. If something happens and your parents come home, something bad happens, even if you didn't do it, it was maybe the youngest one or the third youngest one, your ass is getting reprimanded for it. Why? Because you, you should have known better. That's that's the thing. You should have been watching over the, your little sister or your little brother. You should have known better. You should have kept an eye on them. You should have done this. You should have done that. It's your fault. You should have done Right? The, 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 it's required at your hands. If they got injured on your watch, it's required at your hands. Because you're the one supposed to be watching over them. So that's what the Lord is saying over here. All right? This is the job of a watchman. But they hate us, though. You know, they hate us, so that's all right. <laughs> anyway, uh, verse 30, verse 21. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous man sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. So this righteous man, you tell him, look, hey, you're doing good, stay there. Don't, don't, you might want to do that, don't do that. And he takes heed, and he doesn't sin, he's going to live. And you're going to have delivered your soul. And the hand of the Lord was there upon me, and he said unto me, Arise, go forth into the plain, and I will and I will there talk with thee. And the plain is more like an open area, an open fieldish kind of area. Then I arose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there. So it was basically a chariot, the Lord's chariot was there. As the glory which I saw by the river of Kibar and I fell on my face. So when he saw that chariot, that huge, magnificent chariot, he straight down, paid obeisance. Then the spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spake with me and said unto me, Go, shut thyself within thine house. But thou, O son of man, behold, they shall put bands upon thee and shall bind thee with them, and thou shalt not go out among them. Now, when he, I mean, when you read in the Hebrew, so here's an, here's another thing, right? When you read the scriptures, and this is why it's also important to understand the Hebrew, because don't, when they were translating the scriptures from Hebrew to English, English is a language that has many words, maybe too many words. Hebrew is a, a, a very simple language, okay? Meaning that those little in-between words that you have in Hebrew in, uh, in English, he is going to the store. What he said was that he didn't want to do that. Right? Hebrew doesn't really do all of that. Okay? It's, it's pretty basic. You know, it's kind of like, um, 
what's the word? What's what's an example here? Um, you could say something like Bayaf Dawada, right? If we say Dawada means David and Bayaf is house. If you if you translate that verbatim, that's house David or David house. But in English, we would say like David's house or the house of David. Right. So in, in Hebrew, it's very simple. So when they're translating the Hebrew to the English, they need to put some of these uh, English connectors in there to make the sentence fully make sense. Or else you'd, you'd be reading the, the, the scriptures and it will sound like how the, the Hulk speaks. Hulk smash, you know, Hulk angry, you know, Hulk, Hulk destroy him, you know, instead of, uh, you know, the Hulk is upset or the Hulk is going to do a Hulk smash, something to that effect. I just want to point that out. But pretty much um, when you read this, what the Lord is telling Ezekiel here, right, what this means is that you're going to go, right, shut yourself within your house because you're, you're amongst these Israelites here. But you being, like it says, they shall put bands upon thee and bind thee with them with the bands and thou shalt not go out among them. Really just means that the Lord is going to have it to where Ezekiel was going to, is going to be, you know, he was going to be in his house. He wasn't going to just be going out amongst them, you know, uh, conversing and giving them those, those warnings whenever they wanted. He was on, really only going to speak to them when the Lord wanted him to speak to them concerning the word of the Lord, as he's going to emphasize here in verse 26. And I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth. When your tongue, when you cleave onto something, you're 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 attaching onto it. So making your tongue cleave to the roof of your mouth is as if you lifted up your tongue and and just like slapped it upon the top, the top part of your of your mouth, and you just kept it there. So you're like, you know, you just kept it there, right? And thou shalt be dumb meaning you're not able to speak and and shall not be uh, be to them a reprover for they are a rebellious house. So now this is not literal because if you think about this on a practical sense, when your when your tongue is cleaved to the roof of your mouth, not only are you not able to speak, but you can't really eat, right? <laughs> you can't really eat. How are you going to spit? How are you going to drink water? You can't really do these things, right? And obviously, as, as Ezekiel, Ezekiel had to eat, right? He had to do all these different things. So what this meant was that from verse 24 to verse 26, what the Lord was really telling Ezekiel here is that I'm going to isolate you. And you're only really going to go and amongst them and speak my words onto them when I want you to speak onto them. And that's why in verse 27, it says, but when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. So when I when I when I have a message for you, you're gonna that's when you're gonna go and you're gonna tell them, look, this is what the Lord said. Whether you care, whether you don't, if you're gonna listen, listen. If you're not, that's on you. Okay? But this is what the Lord has to say. And that's pretty much the, the end of the book of Ezekiel, the third chapter. And the Lord has it that way because you, in, in this time, for example, you're going to see an example of this, which is we're out there prophesying, but a lot of people don't really care. However, they're going to wait, the majority of them, until all hell starts breaking loose and the, the things we've been prophesying about start coming to pass. And that's when they're going to run full speed looking to hear the words of the lord but we're not going to be there to reprove or give you the information you're looking for because we are not here to to give you the information on your time we're giving the information on the lord's time so when the lord wants when the lord wills that's when you get the information and the lord is willing now he's been he's been willing for the past couple of decades so when the Lord says, all right, the gates of mercy are closed, my prophets are being taken off the streets, you're done. You're not then going to say, okay, now I want to listen, so now you, now you have to come in and teach me. That's not how it works. Okay? When you go to a store and there's a sale, they tell you, maybe it's Black Friday or whatever, they tell you, 
This is a limited time offer. Meaning, starting Saturday to Saturday, if you come in, you buy one, you get four free. Yeah, whatever. You know, I'm not paying attention to that right now. And then you want to wait till two weeks later and come to the store expecting the sale. It doesn't work that way. The sale, you don't determine the sale. The store does. Because they're, they're the ones giving it. So if you come there two weeks later and say, oh, I'm looking for that, that one. Buy one, get, get uh, three, four free. They're going to tell you that sale is over. It's gone. You get the sale when we give you the sale. Not when you want the sale. But anyway, that's the end of Ezekiel, the third chapter. The Lord basically came to Ezekiel and, and, and commissioned him. Right? Told him, look, this is what I need you to go and do. This, these are the people you're going to go tell them to. These are the conditions you're going to face. But don't worry about it. I've, I've prepared you with everything you need. So with that, Lord willing, this was edifying to the elect. In closing, I want to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Racha Kodash. Until next time, Shalom.